You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. Guess what kind of interview we have for you today? Oh my, how did you know? You're right, an awesome one. We've got a, a speechwriter for a guy you might know, Barack Obama. Uh, David Litt's in the uh, house right here at Rebel Headquarters. He wrote the book, Thanks Obama, My Hopey, Changey White House Years, a Speechwriter's Memoir. David, welcome to the Young Turks. Thank you very much. How do you get to be a speechwriter for Obama? Uh, that's a very, very good question. I spent a couple of years when I first moved to DC, people, and I was a speechwriter in the private sector, and I kind of fell bass backwards into that job. I got an internship at a firm called West Wing Writers. That turned into a job there. And people would say, oh, you should write speeches for Obama. That must be your dream. And I'd be like, well, I don't know. I mean, he has a lot of good speechwriters. I don't think he needs anyone else. And I meant it. Um, and one of the things I write about in the book is the, you have to recognize that jobs like that are right place, right time. You hope you have some talent, but also for me, I was ready to leave. I was gonna go work on the reelection campaign in Chicago. And Valerie Jarrett, the president's senior advisor, had been looking for a writer, hadn't found the right person. And they said, you know, your references are pretty good. What if you just stayed here and worked in the White House? And I was like, okay, I could do that. So that's how I ended up there. And then once I was there, I gradually started writing more speeches for, for President Obama and eventually moved over to the campaign and, and then back into the White House. Okay, so uh, that's not a good enough answer. <laughs> so we're gonna dive more <laughs> okay, into let's it do in it a again. second. But first of all, uh, let me just say uh, that you can tell uh, David's good at framing because let's take a shot of David's camera again. Because look at the framing on this. Has anyone yes. ever put up their book better than this in a Young Turks interview ever in the last 15 years? And, and I did this myself, <laughs> I wanna point out. And I am not artistically minded. This was my arts and crafts project. Okay. I also managed to somehow get the chair, like lower, lower my own the chair. chair. So yeah. before we get, before we tell you- I know, this is ridiculous. Video, I'm yeah, actually- I'm, By the end, I'm just gonna be like on the floor <laughs> looking up at you being like, well, let me talk about my book. But this is not how tall yeah. we are, actually. My chair is cranked up and his yeah, is down. Yeah, I don't even know how to fix it, so okay, whatever. Right. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll look up and you can ask Maybe me questions Andy from on high. Maybe sneak in and, and help good. us fix that. Okay, anyway. <laughs> So let's back up. Uh, where um, I, I don't know why I, I'm obsessed with this question, but I think it maybe because I think it is somewhat telling. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in New York, uh -huh. on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. In New York, I used to do amateur stand-up comedy mm -hmm. um, when I was the weird 15-year-old at comedy night. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. See, so, see, now this begins to explain it. Okay. Although the way that our chairs are now, you look, or you're back to being the 15. -year -old. I know. Now I really do. <laughs> <laughs> this has an unintended comedic effect. Yes. That's kind of working. <laughs> anyway, but you, as a 15 year old, you had enough balls to walk in and do stand up comedy. Well, that was in New York. In New York, that was my way, I think, of rebelling without actually doing any rebelling. Like I didn't drink alcohol in high school, but I did show up and do. Five minutes of stand up because my parents couldn't really comprehend that. Uh -huh. And oh, they were very nice. They were like, we don't really get it, but we're going to chaperone you to the comedy club. So, uh, you know, they were supportive, but it was something that I think they were just didn't understand. So I was like, oh, I got to do that because we all are doing that when we're 15. Uh -huh. And when I was in college, I did improv comedy, I edited a humor magazine, I interned at The Onion. The summer before I started working for Obama, I was an intern at The Onion. And I thought that's what I was gonna do after the, I graduated college in 08. So you're super young, because if you were interning for The Onion right before you went to Obama, how old are you now, David? So I'm third, I just turned 31. Yeah, um, okay, that's great, that's amazing. So how were you received when you started doing comedy at 15? Uh, you know, I was luckily oblivious enough that I didn't realize how strange it was. I was like, oh, of course, like this person, you know, also when you're, when you're 15, everybody is either like your age or 75 years old. So I was like, oh, okay, it's me and then a couple 75 year olds. But uh, I, I think I did okay. I haven't gone back and looked. I have those VHS tapes somewhere, and there's a reason I don't watch them ever. Um, but the, for, so I was in college, and, and when I went to, to the Obama campaign first, so I started, I was in 2008, I was watching. Uh, one of those little plain TVs, like mm -hmm. on uh, on free in-flight cable, mm -hmm. and 
I saw Obama speak. Oh, now we're at the same level. Okay, okay I figured out yeah, how to fix it without bringing <laughs> uh, any our state trooper. Okay, you take a shot of us. Okay, see, I just lowered yes. my chair. Okay, there, there, there we, we go. go. <laughs> I have to say, this, am I the first person to ever successfully do do that, or not, or unsuccessfully do that? Manage to like lower like your lower chair the chair, not be yes in 15 years. <laughs> I think so. Okay, so this, <laughs> is what, this is what I wrote a book about: was how did somebody like me who does stuff like that end up at the White House? <laughs> and I wanted to demystify it a little bit because. Because it is true, you walk through the White House and you're like, this, you know, you go into the gates and you think this must be full of people who don't do dumb things. And it turns out, as I tell you many times in my book, that's not the case. I mean, I, the first week I was in the White House, I put a full cup of iced coffee through the conveyor belt by the metal detector, which immediately tipped over and spilled everywhere. And the Secret Service agent looks at me and he's like, you know, there's not a lot of metal in that, right? Like just a thought for next time. <laughs> and and I can see him add me to the do not save list. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. um, and so, but I always thought that you know you get a White House job and you stop doing things like that, and you're you know the the chair maintenance situation works out fine. That's not the case. I still am that person, but also managed to to write some speeches for President Obama. Yeah, and guys, I do want you to take a lesson out of that because I remember. Like so, I think we've been we're we're doing okay over here. Uh, we just won a streamy last night for best news show of the year. I think for the fourth time, but it might be the fifth. Congratulations! Uh, so thank you. Um, but I remember when I was a, um, a lawyer, ever so briefly, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I had screwed up a memo, and this partner <laughs> asked me like, what? <laughs> May I put him in my dad's voice? What is this? <laughs> right? And I tried to grab a pen out of the pen thing, and I flipped the pen case, and all these pens flew out. And I was trying to pick him up, and he's just like, "Leave it, leave it, leave it." So we've all we've all had our moments, and and what I want you guys to know is that failure is an option. <laughs> okay, and it's okay. You learn from those. Yeah. And one day, maybe if you're lucky enough and good enough, like David, you wind up at the White House. So, okay, so you're doing the comedy. Where'd you go to college? So I went to Yale. Yale, and then that's where you're doing the. Yeah. The and, and, and at Yale, I was not like um, an academically minded person. I, I majored in history, but not because for any good reason. That was kind of what you majored in if you didn't exactly know what you wanted to do with your life. And I got very good at reading the first chapter of the assigned reading mm -hmm. and sounding like I had read the whole thing in discussion sections later on. Oh, don't I know, brother? Yeah. That was my MO. That was Uger 101 <laughs> in college. <laughs> right. And that's sort of how I think that's actually good training for lawyers. It's really good training for speechwriters. I did not know this. I did not know that this was pre professional when I was kind of BSing my way through class. But actually, it ends up being a lot of speech writing was saying, okay, I don't have enough time to become an expert. So I'm gonna just know the, the five minute version of this and be able to kind of comprehend it, but not fully get into the weeds. And so um, it turned out that I had a very good speech writing training as I tried not to do all of the reading <laughs> in, in class. And in uh, so I was on a plane in 08, saw President Obama speak after the Iowa caucuses. So it was January 3rd. 2008, he had just won, mm -hmm. and I saw him give his victory speech. And by the time that speech was done, I mean the the plane landed before the speech ended, so I didn't even see the whole thing. And by the time that speech was done, I was one of those people who would not shut up about Barack Obama. And I've mm -hmm. now written a book called Thanks Obama, so you can see that I have continued to not shut up about <laughs> Barack Obama ever since. But that was I mean, there's very few moments in life where you can say, oh, in this. Five to ten minute window, my entire life changed completely, and that was one of those moments watching him give that speech. So, okay, and I do want to get to the, uh, your uh, moments in the White House yeah. and how that. But I want to finish this thought first. So, okay, you see that speech, your life has changed, but what happens next? Yeah. So let, I'll give you the short version so we can get to the White House stuff. Um, I drove to Ohio, worked on the campaign right after I graduated in 2008. Moved to DC with no real plan, basically just like hope and change, and we'll see how that works out. I did mm -hmm. not think I was gonna get a job in the administration or anything like that, mm -hmm. and I didn't for a couple of years. I started off, I was the worst intern, I think, in Washington for several months. Um, I won't go into all the details, but I will say, uh, and you, you can read the book, you'll find out the whole story because it gets even worse. But I was the intern who brought in their laptop from home and set up a new office in the break room because I didn't like my cubicle. So mm -hmm. basically, I, I should have been fired and run out of town and mm -hmm. fortunately was not. And I 
ended up at this speech writing firm that I mentioned. I was a friend's brother was a speech writer, helped me get this internship. That internship turned into a job because all of the associate writers were leaving for the administration because they had some experience. So suddenly I was there and they were looking for someone new and so they hired me. And two years after that, I kind of hit this point where I said, this was great, I enjoyed writing speeches, but I'm gonna go to Chicago and unpack boxes at the reelection headquarters till they hire me to do anything, I don't care what. And I was about to leave, I had subletted my room and I had scheduled my going away party in DC when I got that White House job. And so I had a going away party in which everyone said, "Oh, we're gonna miss you. And I said, actually, I'm not going away, which was the best party. Like, I don't know, that's what I think people should take away from this interview. Forget the White House stuff. If you can have a going away party for yourself where you're not going anywhere, you should totally do it. Cuz it's great, like all these people say the nice things about you that they wouldn't have said otherwise and then you get to see them the next week, it was wonderful. Yeah, I, I had an idea a long time ago, which then later got put into a movie. But because of somebody else had the idea, okay. not because they heard it from me, about doing pre-funerals. So you know, we pick a friend, right, <laughs> and go, hey, you know what? Why are we going to say all these nice things about him after he dies? Right. Why don't we just do it now? That's a good. I feel like you should do that, and and it reminds me of like Tom Sawyer, you know, at his own at his own watching his own funeral because he got to do that. It worked out well for him. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I remember correctly, yeah, we should all do that. All right, that, that can be the next the next time I'm on, it could be for my pre-funeral, we'll see. Right. So you go to the White House, how did you move on up on the Upper East Side or on the Upper West Wing? Uh, yeah. Um, so I, yeah, so I started writing for Valerie Jarrett and for the other senior staff. And the way it worked was uh, Valerie had hired her speechwriter, but the chief of staff, Bill Daly, was told I was the chief of staff speechwriter, and all the senior staff were told I was the senior staff speechwriter. And John Favreau, who was the chief speechwriter at the White House, said, "Oh, you can also sit in on the POTUS meetings, and maybe you can do a couple POTUS speeches." So I was running around trying to do as much as I possibly could, and basically my specialty, if you can call it that, became things that no one else who writes for the president wants to take. So if mm -hmm. somebody's doing the weekly address, which is seen by a lot of people, but you know, once you've written a few of those, it was not the one that everyone wants to write. I would do that. Mm -hmm. My first speech for President Obama was actually it was a five-minute speech in Puerto Rico because there were other bigger things happening that week, and somebody needed to do it. And they said, "Yeah, probably he can do it." And worst comes to worst, if he screws it up, we'll fix it. And so that ended up being how I got more and more experience writing POTUS speeches. Was just periodically saying, hey, no one else is excited about this, I would love to do that thing. And that's um, you know, Valerie in her commencement, she would always use the phrase, put yourself in the path of lightning. That was advice she had gotten, I think from her, her grandmother. And without really meaning to, that's what I feel like I ended up doing. I was kind of there where there was too much going on, there was too much work to do. And so I could say, hey, I'll do it. And little by little, I kind of picked up some experience. So part of the reason I do these interviews is because I want like little life lessons from people who've had some degree of success. And and the one right there is just do it, just step up, right? When, yeah. when, when people can't find other people to do it, say, raise your hand, I'll do it. And and that it sounds like that made all the difference for you. That's absolutely right. Like people ask me, how do I become a speechwriter? And the truth is, speechwriters all come to speechwriting differently because there's not enough of them. There's not like a pre-professional program for speechwriters. But every speechwriter that I know, what they have in common is there was a moment when there was some writing that needed to be done, and no one else wanted to do it. And that was the moment when somebody said, "Oh, you know, I had plans this weekend, but I'll cancel them and I'll write that thing," and they did a good job. And so that ends up being, you know, and I remember I heard maybe it was an interview or a segment where Lin Manuel Miranda was talking about the same, the same sort of thing where he was writing Hamilton. I mean, obviously different scale, right? Mm -hmm. But sort of said it was the kind of thing where he was going out with friends and said, oh wait, I have a great lyric and I'm going to go do that. So I think to some extent, the a common denominator, at least with the people that I worked with, who were all you know incredibly successful and driven, was that someone had worked a weekend at some point when they didn't have to, and found a way to make their own audition for themselves. Yeah. I think that was uh, something that the people I know from the White House had in common. Yeah, that that's great, great story. Uh, I mean, I, Valerie's quote about step into the lightning or whatever that could be taken in two different ways. <laughs> so let's just keep it keep it at. 
step up when you have an opportunity, <laughs> right. step up. Yeah. Um, so, okay, you get in there, you're writing speeches now for a whole host of people, including Obama. Uh, did Obama ever go, who the hell wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> right? or, or did he ever go, who the hell wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that second one in private, I don't know. Um, I, I, what I talk about in the book was, one of the things I admire about President Obama was he was very comfortable being staffed and trusted his staff. So when a new person showed up, he would assume that they were probably pretty good until proven otherwise. But he would also sort of politely but firmly make it clear when you were doing something dumb. So the first time I met President Obama, actually, I had written a video for Thanksgiving, kind of one of these things that was not super important. Happy Thanksgiving, America, pretty basic. Right. And I, we went to tape the video and President Obama walked into the room and he was standing up, so we all stand up, he sits down, we all sit down. And we're about to start taping and Hope Hall, the videographer, stops the president and says, this is David, this is the first video he's ever written for you. And President Obama looks at me and says, "Oh, how's it going, David? And I have no idea what I said. Like I literally blacked out in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could not tell you what I told the president. The next time I saw him, we were, we were in the Oval Office. <laughs> Um, so no, no let's, let's from yeah, drinking, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> the president says hi to David. He's like, God. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, it's totally possible I just passed out, and everyone was polite enough not to tell me. I have no idea because okay. people would say, "Have you met the president?" I'd be, "Have you met Obama?" I'd be like, "Yeah," and they'd say, "What did he say?" And I'd say, "How's it going?" And they'd say, "What did you say?" And I'd say, "I don't know. I blacked out." <laughs> um, and you get that kind of disappointed look. <laughs> but I, uh, I went. So I, I had the next time I met the president was for. Uh, a meeting in the Oval Office, we were filming a different video. This was for Betty White's 90th birthday. Okay, more special than Thanksgiving. Even more, yes. I mean, that's <laughs> like, you know, we have Thanksgiving once a year, Betty White only turns 90 once. And <laughs> uh, we were filming this video, and the uh, you asked sort of the moment where he's like, what's this guy up to? President Obama was not, he was always very, very nice to staff. And that's not true. There are great politicians who do really good things for America, but do not treat their staff the way that you would want. President Obama was always really, really kind and decent to his staff, but he would also let you know when you had done something dumb. So for example, I presented him with a second birthday card. We had one birthday card for him to sign for Betty White. I had this great idea, we're gonna do two different camera angles. So we need two different birthday cards so that we, when we film the second scene, no one's gonna see that he's already written his card. And I walk up to the desk and I say, Mr. President, here's that second birthday card. And he kind of just looks at me and he says, so we're gonna film from, all the way over there, and I said, well, yeah, that's right. And he said, so no one's gonna be able to see the, the inside of the card? And I said, yeah, that's right, so, so I can just pretend to write in this card. I don't actually need to take that second card. It's like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. And, and so he was, you know, would sort of let you know without, <laughs> without, without being too mean about it, but he would let you know that like, well, that was, that was pretty dumb, you could do better. Uh -huh. um, I mean, there was, a, uh, there was another moment in that, same, uh, in that same meeting. So he was supposed to do a joke where he was gonna put in headphones, earbuds, and pretend to listen to the Golden Girls theme song, mm -hmm. which is Betty White's most, you know, yeah. most popular show. And uh, I reach into my pocket for the headphones for this joke, and I pull out what looks like a hairball made out of wires. Like mm -hmm. I don't know what happened, but I've just tangled this thing. It happens to yeah, every it's a time. tumbleweed of wires, and I don't know what to do. So I just hand it to the President of the United States. Uh -huh. um, and if you work in the White House, I write about this in the book. You you hear the phrase, "There is no commodity on earth more valuable than a president's time," mm -hmm. which I always thought was a cliche, until. I watched Barack Obama untangle headphones for 30 seconds while looking directly at me. <laughs> and he finishes untangling and he, he just, he goes, shoddy advance work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this way that he could do where he was letting you know that A, he's just joking and B, he is not even a tiny bit joking. And I've said to people, I've said to you know people who run companies like friends who have startups, I was like, if you can learn to do that, it's really good for just getting your employees motivated in the right way because there you never want to do that again. But also at the same time, you know, you're you're not um, you're not in a place where you're like, well, I just got yelled at by the president. You just know that you made a mistake, and you're like, next time I have headphones, I'm going to be a little bit more careful with that. Yeah. So I want to say two quick things about uh, about that stuff that you just brought up. So one, uh, we now have a president who is not as subtle. Uh, recent article, I think it was in the New York Times, about how he yells at the top of his lungs at 
people and not just a junior speechwriter doing a skit about Betty White, but the chief of staff and the attorney general, etc. So not everybody treats the presidency in the same way in the Oval Office, etc. So those were the good old days in some ways. And and so there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And and I, I would imagine that you guys appreciated the lighter touch a little bit. But you were also savvy enough to pick up on it. Whereas a lot of the knuckleheads around Trump <laughs> might not get it at all. And which leads me to the second thing, which is that people who like the Republicans during the Obama years were like, did that insane talking point about how he's a teleprompter president, right? Which is every president is a teleprompter president. They yeah. all have teleprompters. And it's so obvious when Trump goes on one because he doesn't keep repeating things and he doesn't say insane things because somebody wrote it for him. And so, and people might not realize this might be, for a lot of people, it might be the first time that they know that Obama himself didn't write the Thanksgiving is great, we love America right. speech, right? For the record, I would he would believe those things, I would think, and he would read everything, so he would edit. And that's, I'm glad you brought up teleprompters because it is, as you can imagine, a giant pet peeve right now. Because the Republican argument was, and, and yeah, no, I think Lincoln was the last president to write all of his own speeches or, you know, mm-hmm. so it was, it's been a while. It's, it was like four score and seven years ago <laughs> exactly. that, that that happened. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, that's exactly right. And so, uh, you know, and then over time, the kind of idea, presidents used to pretend they wrote all their own speeches. And then over time, it became sort of acceptable to recognize, okay, there are speech writers, but you want the president to still be speaking in their own voice, to be saying the things they would have written if they had the time to do it. And that's what President Obama did for a big speech, a State of the Union, an important eulogy, something that touched on a sensitive issue in American life. He would get very personally involved. Sometimes he'd do it weeks in advance, sometimes he'd just edit you know, late at night. But you could always tell that the words that he was speaking, those were his. And they sounded like him. So even when he's talking about Thanksgiving, and you know he's not staying up late at night to work on my Thanksgiving video, he's fine with it. <laughs> but it sounds like President Obama. And Republicans, their claim was that you know he must be being sort of manipulated, or he must not really be that smart because he uses a teleprompter, which is really dumb. What's fascinating about it is. Trump is exactly the thing that they were trying to pretend Barack Obama was. Trump is one of the only politicians that I can think of who reads from a teleprompter and clearly has no idea what he's saying. And when he does know what he's saying, he doesn't believe it because he reads these words in order, kind of as a as a gesture. You know, okay, I did it. It's a performance. Sometimes he even basically says that the next day. He's like, "What? You know, you're not upset. You know, this wasn't enough for you because I just read that stuff." And then he goes out the next day and you see who he really is. And he talks about you know how there are very good people who are neo-Nazis. Or he talks about Colin Kaepernick or any of the things that reflect this actual person. And this is exactly what Republicans were saying was the worst thing ever when Obama wasn't doing it. And now Trump is doing it and they're totally silent. And so you can imagine as a speechwriter, it's a little frustrating. Yeah, and I wanna ask one more thing about that. Yeah. So when when you write the Thanksgiving speech, that's just standard. You know, every president gets one. Trump will get one. We'll see if he actually says it, right? right? Or what in the world he does with it. Can I just stop? For, I will say there are very few things that would make me like Donald Trump even a tiny bit. But for the turkey pardon, if he names the turkeys Jared and Donald Jr., I would be, <laughs> I would be totally willing to be like that was a that was a good call. He's never going to do that, but oh, wouldn't that be great? Inconceivable. Yeah, uh, it's inconceivable he'd ever do anything intentionally funny. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so, uh, but the race, for example, an important speech, uh, and no disrespect to your Thanksgiving no, speeches, but. But like the the speech he gave about race in 2008, Mm -hmm. you know, the Reverend Wright controversy come happens, and then he's got to give a speech kind of to rescue, honestly, his campaign. And it was one of the best speeches you've ever seen. And there, uh, I imagine, I don't know if you have any insight on it. he does a lot more of the writing. It's more personal. And and by the way, to be fair to the Republicans, Reagan would heavily edit his speeches too. So it's it's not like the you know you know Trump. He seems like he's reading like Adam. And right. to, again, to be bipartisan here, 
It reminds me of Al Sharpton a little bit. Like Al Sharpton would get on and be like, okay, what is it that people wrote for me? Okay, I will now read this. But most presidents will get a speech, they'll edit it, put it more in their voice, including Republicans and Democrats. And then, and do you know how much of those early speeches he himself wrote? Um, I don't know the exact sort of percentage and and uh, John Favreau who was the chief speechwriter on the campaign and David Axelrod who was kind of the messaging guru. Um, you know, I was in college when he gave the race speech. So like every sort of Obama fan, I was watching to see what he would say and hope that he would strike the right tone and, and confident that he would, but also incredibly impressed when he did. Um, for bigger speeches and earlier speeches, he was often more personally involved because by the time I was at the White House, one of the great things about writing for a president is everything they've said is on the, it's not all on the record, but everything they've said publicly is transcribed and searchable. So if you wanna say, has President Obama ever, does he like yogurt? You don't have to find a way to ask the president, excuse me, Mr. President, I know you're worried about you know what's happening in Syria, but what, how do you feel about yogurt? You can go to Nexus, Lexus Nexus and do some searching and figure out, has he ever talked about that? And also for more, more serious things, what has he said about education? What has he said about race? So that you, you, know, you can at least figure out, he may have edits on top of that, but here's his language that he already used that is personal to him. We would even go back pretty frequently and say, what did he say in Dreams from My Father about this particular issue? Or did he have a story that might relate to something that we're talking about? Um, you know, I remember, he talked about, uh, we, we honored the teacher of the year once and I helped write that speech. And I'm pretty sure this was one of those dreams from my father moments. We looked back and said, is there a teacher he's talked about as being kind of his defining influence? And he talked about his fifth grade teacher and you know, how much of an impact that teacher had on him. So you were able to do some of that work that you would normally, if I was writing a speech for you, we would need to sit down and I would say, tell me about your fifth grade teacher. You know, What was her name? What was she like? With the president, if you were willing to put in the work and you had a speech writing staff as we did that really cared about crafting a president's words and making them more than just some words on the teleprompter, but making them really reflect this person and his vision for America, you, you could do that. So that's great, and I, I didn't know that, and that makes a lot of sense. So if someone were to bother writing a speech for me, uh, they'd go back and find out this guy likes nutty bars. And so <laughs> they might write in something about nutty bars. And then when I read it, I'd be like, that's true, I do like <laughs> nutty bars. That's what I would say. So all right, is there a speech that you're most proud of? Well, there's kind of two that I write about in, in the book toward the end. So I, I started at the White House, I was the most junior level speechwriter. When I left, I was not like the guy in the inner circle. I was kind of on the junior rung of the senior staff. So doing, you know, I was a, a senior presidential speechwriter, which meant I did some kind of bigger than Thanksgiving video speeches. One mm -hmm. of them that I'm very proud of was to the NAACP convention in 2015 about criminal justice reform. And that was one where President Obama was very personally involved because we had talked about criminal justice reform before, but we hadn't woven together all the threads in that way. And so the the draft that I put together then went to the president. He did a lot of personal changing. That was one where there's kind of a, a page of yellow legal paper that has a whole paragraph that's new. He moved some, some big sections around, but what made me really proud about that speech is the, the final result that President Obama delivered. His speech was one that really wove together the arguments and the stories and the, the narrative and the facts and the values in ways that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you go back and read it. It, just, it all seemed to kind of flow. And the other thing that was important about at the time, you know, now Jeff Sessions is our Attorney General, Chris, criminal justice reform is kind of, we're fighting to maintain the progress we already made. But at the time, this was a more bipartisan issue. And to be able to make a case both that this is a moral issue, but also that it's about fiscal responsibility, that we're spending $80 billion a year keeping people locked up and some of that money could go to schools. And to do both of those things at once. Um, I write in the book about how in, in presidential speeches, every audience has to be the entire United States. And so it's rare, but really special when you feel like you worked on something that connected with the people in the room and everyone watching wherever they happen to be equally well. And then um, it's the, and one other speech that I'm, I'm very proud of, but was not nearly as uh, sort of weighty was uh, I helped bring Keegan-Michael Key, the comedian from Key and Peele 
in as Luther Obama's anger translator on stage at the 2015 Correspondence Center. And that was just one of those moments where it was so much fun to work with one of my comedy heroes, to work with one of my actual life heroes at the same time mm-hmm. on this bit. And I, what I write about is how in the rehearsal, President Obama could not stop laughing during the rehearsal. Keegan mm-hmm. would say a line as Luther, Obama's anger translator, and President Obama would just lose it. But then uh, on stage at the actual dinner, he managed to keep it together, which I think is you know on his list of big tough things to do as president, not super high, but was impressive nonetheless. All those are, are amazing moments and, and to be able to affect history a little bit by even writing a speech about criminal justice reform. It's just, it's, it's awesome, it's fantastic and, and you worked hard to get there. So, all right, but I'm gonna end on a downer note. Okay, uh, yeah, let's nonetheless, do okay. <laughs> Now that we've had fun, let's, yeah, let's move it on. Was, it was triggered by your talk of criminal justice reform. So with for me, with Obama, everything was uh, a little change, whereas I was hoping in a hopey, changey kind of way, as right. your book title says, uh, that it would be a lot of change. Was there anything you were disappointed by? Well, and and uh, and I appreciate getting to th- this far before we get to the downer moment. But I think that um, well, let me start by answering your question, and then I'm going to answer a, a related question. Um, the to me the most disappointing thing, and it's something that President Obama has spoken about. When I came to Washington, it was not just the idea that we were going to change America with the policies that would be implemented and passed. It was this idea that we were gonna change Washington, that Washington was gonna finally work better and work the way it was supposed to. And our democratic institutions were gonna be stronger. And that clearly didn't happen. And one of the the challenges for the next democratic administration, hopefully soon, is not just gonna be cleaning up this terrible mess that Trump is leaving us, but figuring out how do we fix our democratic institutions so that they this doesn't happen again. So that we end up in a country where what the American people want is reflected in what Washington is doing, which right now is not happening. And the answer can't just be find an inspiring person and put them in the White House because that's not enough. And we need to figure out how to do even more. And it is, um, you know, I, I think we made an effort, but clearly we fell short there. And the next generation of people changing America, we're gonna have to figure out how to get that right. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. I did want to say one one thing to me, and and you know whether some of your viewers may agree with me on this, some of them may not. When they finish the book, obviously, I, I hope they read it. And I did want to talk about what it feels like to be part of incremental progress, because I think we made huge changes in the Obama administration. Um, you know, we can debate uh, whether they were enough, not enough, but the country was substantially different when he left office, and a lot of people's lives were better than when he entered. Um, but I wanted to write not so much about what Obama did because I don't think that I'm an expert on Obama's legacy, but about what it feels like to be in it, not just during those first few months when it feels like everything's gonna be fixed by the time you know I was 21. I was like, by the time I'm 25, all the problems are gonna be solved. And then <laughs> you know, who knows what I'll get to spend the rest of my life doing. And you realize that that's not how that works. And what does it feel like day to day? And there's some real highs and beautiful moments. There's also some really difficult, frustrating moments. And then there's the random, funny, weird stuff that happens. You know, you, you black out in front of the president, or <laughs> uh, there was a time I got caught in the coat closet of Air Force One trying to change clothes, and you know, a colleague opened the door, and I'm in my underwear in front of my, my staffer colleagues on Air Force One. Uh, that is a part of public service too, or at least it was for me. And I wanted to try to write a book that covers all of that. Um, and yeah. so hopefully it'll be, you know, not, uh, I don't think it's gonna, uh, change your mind if you about what Obama did or his legacy, but it might kind of uh, give you a little bit more insight into what it really felt like in that moment. Yeah, no, I totally get it. And look, of course, there are disagreements, and I think the way you change the Washington culture is you you break the Republicans back and you drink their spinal fluid, <laughs> uh, and then you get a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics, and you'll be shocked at how much the culture has changed. Yeah, I do. Th- I mean, I think if we can figure out a way, to campaign finance reform. You know, constitutional amendment, and there's things we can be doing, like the Disclose Act, just so that if a donor wants to fund, you know, right now it's getting worse and worse, right? Now you have shady donors funding Trump's legal defense fund, and no one knows who they are. If you're going to do something that corrupt and unethical, that right now, unfortunately, is legal, but 
we could pass a law that says at least we, the American people should know who's paying for what. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is yeah. this is a whole other conversation. No, no, I'm with you. And private financing leads to people working for private interests instead of the public interest. But um, but on the other hand. Uh, now in the Trump years, we see the value of incremental progress. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's it's incremental progress is frustratingly slow, and I actually don't think it's the right strategy. As I've talked about a million times on the show. On the other hand, it is infinitely better than going <laughs> backwards right. at a really really quick pace. Right, and I do <laughs> think one of the things that I certainly felt while I was working in the White House. Um, and leading up to the election, sometimes people felt like the only two choices are between slow progress and fast progress. But as you're saying, there is a third possibility, which is like real backsliding. And we need to make sure to keep that in mind and defend against it, even as we try to move forward as quickly as we can. All, All right. right, David Litt, everybody check out Thanks Obama, my Hopi Changey White House years. Uh, by the way, New York Times called it masterly. Uh, and rousing, they, so they did. That's a hell of a <laughs> review. Great job, David. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. If you liked this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen. If you're a member, only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com/join. And you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school, and all of it commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.